Hi, Sister Mary John. How are you? Hi. Bye. Thanks so much for making time. It's such a pleasure to be talking to you. Where are we catching you today? What are you up to? Well, I'm here in the convent. It's, pan- it's pandemic. It's, of course. Uh, <laughs> I'm here. I am here in my room in the convent. Yeah, how, how have things been going then in Manila? How are things? Well, it's the same thing. People cannot go out. Oh, well, it's a little bit more more uh, locker. <laughs> but um, people are still having not having no jobs and things like that. And people from 15 to 59 can go out, but uh, senior citizens are supposed not to go out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the thing is that so many people have lost their jobs and many people are hungry. That is what is the situation right mm-hmm. now. Yeah, it seems to be going up all over, doesn't it? So, tricky times for sure. What? Thanks so much uh, for joining us, of course, and talking and agreeing to talk on the podcast. It's such a pleasure reading about you and reading about the, uh, the story you wrote for Sidzi about advocating for women. And of course, you've had a long history of advocating for women and for the poor throughout your life and throughout the Philippines and throughout the world, really. Um, Let's start, I was, if sorry with you, I wanted to start kind of at the beginning though. You were, after college, at the age of 19, you entered the convent, of course. Mm -hmm. And what, you've, you've talked about kind of the different things that you felt called to, but what was going on at that time? Why, why the convent for you? And just talk about Kind of your thought process at that moment what spurred you to that you know i tell people don't ask me why i entered ask me why i remained because <laughs> okay. at, 19, nine, at 19 what do you know of life nothing really and why the comment because i have been here since i was 11 years old and i was bringing the books of the sisters to the convent i i listened to them while they are chanting and and when we have retreat we are in their chapel so the, that is the life i was living in well, of course, there are certain things to like. I was very curious about the so-called spiritual life. I I got a book which has a very in, un, understandable title called Heliotropum, which I don't understand what. But I remember I I got that as a my retreat book. So I I went down to the ruins. You know, they bombed this this place, the Americans. So we have ruins all over the Saint Cecilia. I I sat on a on a room in uh, what called cement, and I was reading that book and it's talking about the interior life, you know, the purification. And I, I was very curious, I have another life, you know. And then another thing also is uh, I got hold of a book that's called You Can Change the World. Oh my God, I can change the world. <laughs> and it is talking about how you can take part in social transformation, etc., etc. So I, I suppose these three factors, you no. Know, uh, my, my interest about this so-called interior spiritual life, the thing of, about how do you help people who are in need. And of course, my, as I said, the inertia of being with the sisters all the time from since I was 11 years old. So these are the things that, that, that may be, uh, is the, are the ones that, that uh, made me think, okay, I will try this uh, convent life and I will try it very young so that if it's not for me, I can go out. I was only 19, you know. But the thing is, the, the longer I, I was in the convent, I find more and more reasons why I want to stay. So now I have, I have actually celebrated my 60 years of profession in the convent. Can you imagine that? Congratulations, of course. Thank you. <laughs> Wait, you mentioned you, you thought, oh, I have this other life, this internal spiritual life. What what do you mean exactly by that? And what did you mean at the time exactly? What, what do you remember thinking kind of that in, you have another life? Well, it was talking, that, that book was talking about, you know, when you you become, uh, you go into deep into yourself, then you, you find out that there is uh, there's a, a life, there's a kind of life with God that is not, that is, deeper than your your ordinary life you know so that got me really interested and of course now i mean to say everybody knows uh, about the inner consciousness the real self you know that is the that is the teaching of all religions buddha talks about the real self isn't it 
and Hindu says you oh, God is in you as you. So this whole thing of one consciousness connected with God and all the universe. Now that is that is uh, what you call the the inner life, you know, that is different from your ordinary life of going to going to school, cooking, and things like that. Mm-hmm. And so it's like you know, for me, like religious life is a, I call it a mystic prophetic aspect. The mystic there is the contemplation. You know, you get to learn how to contemplate in the convent. But there is no, what I find in my life, there is no contradiction between um, being a mystic and being a prophet. Being a prophet meant you become an activist. Like, I'm an activist, but I don't consider, you know, people think it is like contradiction. If you are contemplating, then you, you should have nothing to do with the world and politics and all that. And if you are an activist, then it's like prayer life for you is not important. That's not true at all, you know. It is from the contemplation that, that you get the inspiration and the strength and the urge to, to do something about, about uh, life and about helping people who are in need. Mm-hmm. So for yes. two, yeah, these two are very much connected. And, and especially my Benedictine uh, mode is ora et labora, no? ora prayer, mystic. Labora is work, profit. So they two together, okay? That's how yeah. I understand my religious life. No, definitely. And it it rhymes so much with what Pope Francis has been saying in as he th- throughout his papacy, right? During the season of creation, just oh, finished yeah, up. You know that, okay. Yeah, October fourth, just finished up um the season of creation, the ecumenical season of creation, and Pope Francis urged all Catholics to take time for contemplation. That's how we appreciate the beauty of creation. And so yeah. so I was struck by so much of and so much of what you're saying and what you have said throughout your career and how much it, it rhymes um, with what Pope Francis wrote in Let Out to See, Integral Ecology. And you talk about integral, I don't want to get it wrong here. Integral Ecology. Pope Francis talks about integral ecology. And then you talk about integral evangelization, integral salvation, yeah. right? The idea, Pope yeah. Francis talks about integral ecology, the idea that everything is connected. And yeah. you've talked about how, you know, every, the whole human being is part of that yeah. integral evangelization. And that has been a big part of your career, right? Taking yeah. everything together, right? Not looking at something in isolation, but looking at it all together. Yes. Why has that sure. been the case? Why have you, like, how did that come about? And why has that always been the case rather than, I mean, the alternative, I guess? Uh, what do you mean? I mean, it's always been like that. <laughs> sorry, say that again? Because- I entered the Benedictine order, and, and from the very start, we had the motto of ora et labora. Only that, it got deeper. Because sometimes I say ora uh, when we are in the chapel, and labora when we are in school. But for me, the ora there becomes deeper than, becomes deeper than just you know being in the choir together. That's part of it. But also the, your own personal contemplation. You know? And... Prophecy for me is, or labora, it became, became for me prophecy, which means that I am not just in the convent doing the chores in the convent and teaching, but that I am now engaged in, in uh, fighting against injustice, being in solid, solidarity with the poor and the oppressed, and so forth and so on. So it became broader, no? Labora is not only just manual work and all that, but it's this whole, uh, the whole... Uh, this whole activity of of working for justice and defending people who who are being oppressed, so that becomes work, a part of your labora, I think. Mm-hmm. And but it oh, it wasn't always that way while you were a nun, right? It was you were you had to enter the convent at nineteen, obviously, but then it wasn't until some twenty years later, almost, when you kind of had that conversion, which fire. yeah, yeah. Go ahead, yeah, talk because, about. Yeah. yeah, because you know, when you entered the convent, in, that is the time of uh, before the Vatican II, that was 1957, and Vatican II is 1965. So I had all the traditional uh, novitiate, actually, you know, uh, silence, um, 
and uh, just being in the convent, cannot go out, etc. Obedience. Well, these are all there still, but now you interpret it in a very different way. Hmm? So the activism part there is that what happened was that uh, well, I was I was I was sent to after ten years in the convent. That means when I was twenty nine, I was sent to to Germany to study. You no, know? so I passed by Rome. I went to Germany and I studied in Münster, Westphalen. You know, and Karl Rahner was my my teacher <laughs> in systematic theology. But of course. My major was philosophy, and uh, actually, after two years, I went to to Rome in the Gregorian University, and made my I made my doctorate in linguistic philosophy. Okay, so that is a part of my whole uh, the whole history of my life. And then, I, when I was coming home, it was martial law in the Philippines. So at first, when I was in the on the plane, I said. Oh, maybe that's what we need. We need discipline because we people, we Filipino people are not very disciplined, not like you Germans. <laughs> Isn't it? You're German, aren't you? Are you German? Bis the Deutsch? From the U.S. I'm from the U.S., but yeah. I'm sorry. But the German I, mean, my family, I think my family is. No, I mean, no. Oh. Oh. Oh, but yeah, that. but continue. But anyway, <laughs> I learned discipline from the Germans, okay? So anyway, when I came home, it did not take long when I saw all the restrictions, all the, you cannot make a strike, you cannot go together with five people, people were being arrested, people were being killed, people were being tortured and all that. I said, no, 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 this is not what, what I think uh, we need as the people. And then, as I said, I had that baptism of fire where uh, I was, there was a strike because it was not, it was not allowed to have a strike. But but the the uh, conditions of work in, in a factory, it's wine factory actually, was becoming so bad that there were 600 workers there and they declared a strike even though it's forbidden. So after three days, the we called the Metrocom at that time, that is the police, uh, that, that they will come and, and disperse them. So the sisters and some priests, they, we had this, uh, they had this, um, um, phone brigade, telephone brigade. And I got my telephone call at 11 o'clock and they told me, let's all go to that Latundeña, that's the name of the of the factory, and let us help the workers there. So we went. Uh, you know, there's a funny part that I'm sure you read it somewhere because I wrote that in my thing, that my superior was already asleep and, you know, as Benedictines, I should not go out in the middle of the night, you know, without permission. So I just wrote her a letter. I said, dear sister Catherine, I'm going to the strike in Natundenia. I don't know when I'll be back. Love, Mary John. So I went. And <laughs> that is my first encounter with military brutality because, you know, some of us sisters went inside the, the factory and, you know, what we call here, Capit Bisig, we, we link uh, arms with the, with the workers. But the thing is, the, the military said, you better go out. If, if not, we are coming in and and you will get hurt. I remember I was asking a military man, why are you, why are you going inside and, and taking them? And he said, it is curfew. And I said, but they're inside. So why are you, why are you going to, to uh, arrest them when it's curfew? We are outside. Why is it that you are not arresting us? I said, and he said, you are not included. And then they went inside and really beat up the workers. And you can imagine the feeling of the sisters. The one on my right is a worker. They beat him up. I see all the blood like this. And then you, because you're a sister, you are not beaten up. The next one is a worker. Then they beat them up too. And then they were all pushed into a bus, not even letting them sit down, just push them like that. And all of them, you know, bloodied like this because they were beaten up you know, in the head like this. So I said to myself, now this cannot be, my goodness. I do not know if Jesus will tell them to turn the other cheek at this point. So what we did is uh, because after some time we look at each other because they were all taken away, 600 of them. And we couldn't even get into the buses because they were closed. In fact, two sisters and one priest tried to get in. So they went and, and held on. But then the, the driver did not open it. So it was running and the sisters and that priest were hanging there until the police, the chief of police came and really 
forcibly uh, uh, really just uh, took them out of the of the bus. So and, and so in our reflection, then because we said, what happened? Why is it that that we couldn't do anything? We were so helpless. And then we realized that it's too late to help the workers at the strike. We have to start from the beginning, from the condition of work, from their from their uh, salary, which is not much. And so we we started the, a movement called Friends of the Workers. So that is how it began. My my life in the streets, if you want to call it like that, you know. So I call it my baptism of fire. And then you continued on from there. Obviously, you were serving as a chairperson of Gabriella, um, two hundred women organization serving at Saint Scholastics yeah. College as the dean and in other roles. And you've kind of, but that kicked it off obviously for seeing what you saw and everything. What has, how have you, I mean, you've been facing big fights, right? Big battles where you, um, it's an uphill battle, I guess to say, right? How have you nurtured your spirit to keep going in that? Cause I think it's some of those fights that you've, and some of those causes. <laughs> yep. Yeah. How have you kept kind of nurtured your spirit to keep going in front of such daunting odds. Cause I don't, I mean, in the climate crisis now, there's so much that is, there's reasons not to be hopeful, but there are so many reasons to be hopeful as well. So I'm curious how you have found ways to nurture your spirit to, to keep going. In the because you know, I never left the convent. I mean to say I did exactly the same. People think that just because I'm in the street, I'm not praying anymore. Of course not. I, pr I pray five times a day. We, we get up at, uh, at uh, well, now it's pandemic, so we get up at 5.20, actually before we get up at 4.50. Then we have Lord's, that's morning prayer. Then we have Holy Mass, and then we have breakfast. Then we go to our work. Then we have another midday prayer. And then after that, we have Vespers. And then we have one hour of contemplation. Then we have recreation and supper. Then we have complaint. So even while I was on the seat, I was very faithful to that to that uh, spiritual uh, exercises that we have in the convent. So that is the one that gave me strength because I was never kind of uh, separated from that, that uh, fountain of energy that, that is being actually lived by, by nuns. No, I mean, say we have a, a whole, uh, our whole orarium is, is that, no? I mean, we pray and work ora et labora. And even when I'm on the streets, okay, I'm in the streets from, let's say, 9 to nine to 12, or if the rally is from 2 to 4, okay, 2 to 4. But I come home and, and pray vespers with my sisters afterwards, no? So that's it. Mm -hmm. And you always spend time in creation, right? I think in the morning, you do your, your Tai Chi, your 10 minutes outdoors. Oh, actually, actually. Yeah, well, I do it with my sisters after mass. Mm -hmm. I do it with the sisters, but uh, sometimes inside but mostly outside after mass. And sometimes uh, lay people come and, and they, they do shibashi with it. It's called shibashi, by the way. Oh, gotcha, yeah. okay. I read it incorrectly, my apologies. Mm -hmm. um, why, how important has it been for you throughout your career then to, to spend time in creation and to feel that nourishment while spending time in creation? Spend, well, as I said, I mean to say, you know, it's like when you are you are running a motor. I mean, at some time you need gasoline, isn't it? And if you never get gasoline, then you cannot drive, you cannot run. So that is the, the gasoline that that feeds your your energy to to do something, no? So you your spiritual uh, your contemplation, your your spiritual nourishment is the one that feeds you, gives you the strength and even the courage to dare things. That you wouldn't dare if you had no, no conviction that that God is with you. Isn't it? That's mm -hmm. it. Nobody can do anything with me, I think. <laughs> even now. Even now. Because, because if you are connected with God, then, I mean, what can they do to you anyway? What is the worst thing that they can do to me now? Kill me? I'm 83 years. I'm 82 years old. I have already finished everything that that uh, is worth aspiring for, educational, academic, whatever. Oh, I have founded the Institute of Women's Studies. I became president of the college. I became prioress. What else will I do? 
is <laughs> this so i just i just live my life one one day at a time and i i just thank god every morning i say oh god i thank you for this beautiful day i thank you that i'm still alive and and healthy keep me so and just help me to live this day with mindfulness compassion and joy that is my prayer every day and of course i am involved in so many rallies right now you know i wanted to mention to the hospital that you were instrumental in helping build oh, yeah. oh, in one of the remote <laughs> remote parts of the philippines one of the more remote parts of the philippines you also planned i think there was plans for a mini forest and an herbal garden on the side as there. well it yeah, is there it's there in the same place no yeah uh, they promised us there are coconut trees there now but the the trees we planted are still it will grow in 10 years maybe okay <laughs> We have enough land for it. Mm -hmm. And why, I'm struck too, why is that, you know, you've gotten so much attention for the activism you've done, but obviously there's creation and then there's parts of this that are always kind of trickled throughout your story as well. Why was that so important to have the forest, have the garden and have that connection with creation? Yeah, because, and that we, hospital? because we, we have three and a half hectares and the hospital building is only occupying about half a hectare. So what will we do with the two and a half hectares? And of course, I have already, already been an ecological activist since then. So the first thing that comes to my mind is, oh, I will plant all the Philippine uh, hardwood here. That's the first thing that I thought how to use the, the land. And now actually our convents, all of our, we have 20 houses, by the way, in the Philippines, no? And uh, most of us have, uh, all of us, all our convents have farms, you know, and it is really organic farming that we are trying to trying to promote. Because our our convent in our general chapter, we really made um, we made uh, what they call this resolution to be ecological activists, the whole the whole congregation. So we are asked to plant so many trees in one year so many trees like that, to use green construction principles, to uh, teach our schools, uh, you know, ecologically, ecologically uh, healthy habits, like, uh, you know, like waste management, waste uh, segregation and all that, no soft drinks and things like that, healthy food. So th that's what we are teaching in our, all our schools also. We have 11 schools. How else do you remain um, curious? What other examples? Of how do how else you and uh, your fellow sisters remain committed to ecological activism, ecological preservation? Uh, what is the question again? Yeah. How? What are other examples? The ways that you and your sisters remain committed to ecological preservation in your work um, throughout? Yeah. As I told you, we had a general chapter. You know, when the general chapter makes resolutions, you are supposed to, we have the general chapters in Rome. You know, we have uh, priorities, we call it provinces all over the world. Every six years, we have a general chapter in Rome. And the general chapter has a theme, no? And the general chapter comes up with resolutions that have to be implemented in all priorities. So when the general chapter tells you, we are now going to be, ecological uh, ecological uh, advocates then when we come back to the philippines we have our own priority chapter with our 21 schools 21 houses and then we say okay the general chapter told us we should be ecological uh, advocates how do we do it concretely in the philippines then we make we make a calendar of what we will do first is we educate all the nuns we educate all the all the our students about e ecological consciousness. And then we promote things like planting trees, then getting all the farms, um, uh, buying all these farms for all the convents. And then we get our, our students to plant trees in our farms. And also we, if the city has a, has a campaign to, to plant trees along the Pasig River, then we send our students there. When we have an Earth Day and the, the bishop at four o'clock in the morning makes a procession, we all go with the procession. So it is like that. There is an ecological education and there is ecological, uh, what you call this, uh, always uh, conferences, 
and seminars. So our sisters are really very conscious about preserving the ecology because we have only one planet and we cannot say, I cannot say to the planet, stop now, I'll get out of this planet. I cannot, this is my only planet, my only home. So that's what we are trying to, to, to teach our students because they are the future. And that's why we are fighting mining also and logging. You know, a lot of multinational corporations here are mining all our treasures we, that has been there for, for millions of years. And then in 50 years, they take it all out. Can you imagine that? And not only that, then they send, because usually these mines are in the indigenous people's um, territory. So what do they do? They drive away the indigenous people, you know? And, and then our government sends military not for our indigenous people, but to defend the miners, the multinational corporation people. So the military is there to protect them. You know, instead of protecting our own people, they are protecting the, the capitalists, you know? And actually we are not even getting so much because they do not process the metals that they have, that they get. And they're, they have very, very little uh, tax. You know, so we are really the losers in all this mining thing. Yeah, so much um, destruction happening, isn't there? And that, yeah. it tails well with um, this Pope Francis' recent words during the season of creation for the Earth's resources to be shared, not plundered. And people yeah. can go to standwithpopefrancis.org to learn more about the ongoing um, campaign calling for the world's resources to be shared and not plundered. Yeah, and you can read more about like, Sister Mary John in that as well. So, sorry, go I mean, ahead. What he, what he calls a uh, throwaway economy, that's, that's true. Mm -hmm. You can see all the things that are being thrown away is unbelievable, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, end on a more positive note. So you'll be you're almost 83. What's so another 20, 30 years of activism and prayer and <laughs> contemplation or? I don't know. I, you know, I never plan anything. Actually, I never plan things. The only thing that I do is just be conscious at the moment. And then when a challenge comes or a need comes, and then if I feel as I can do something about it, then I throw all my, my being into it. Like that hospital. I never thought I would ever put up a hospital. I'm not a medical person. But what happened was uh, the bishop wrote to me and said, you know, we have no hospital here and our, our people here, they, when they go to the next hospital, it's six hours away, they will die on the way. So why don't you put up here? I said, wow, I never put up a hospital before. <laughs> and then, of course, I, I asked the whole priority, let's all pray about it, whether we get into this thing or not. And so we prayed about it. We had uh, what you call discernment. And then we decided, and then we asked permission from Rome. And then they said, okay, Rome said, if you think that you can, uh, you can do something about it, do it. And you know, whenever I decide to do something, you know what? <laughs> Miracle, synchronicity, I don't know. But the people that I need will come and the money that I need comes. For example, that one, I, we had no land, you know? So we're looking for land and we were willing to buy, but it's so expensive. And then our sisters, three sisters of ours, had to, I, I sent three sisters to look around what we could do there. So they, they uh, rented a house. The landlady said, uh, oh, I have a friend in the US. You know, she, he, oh, she owns some lands here. So she called up that friend, happy birthday. She said, and you know what? There are three sisters here, they want to put up a hospital, but they don't know where they can put the hospital. And you know what this lady said in Chicago? She's Filipino but has been living in Chicago for 20 years. Said, you know, I have six and a half hectares there, seven, seven hectares there. Why don't you give one half to the sisters? So we got it for free, three and a half hectares. Can you imagine for free? Okay, the next thing is, now, I asked an architect, suppose we have uh, this hospital like that, how much do you think we would need to build it? You know what he told me? 100 million. Oh my God, where will I get 100 million? No? To put up a 21-bed hospital will cost you 100 million. I didn't know where to get it. Can you imagine what happened? <laughs> what happened was this. Uh, you, you, know the, you know the March 8th, we have what we call the International Women's Day, and we all march, okay? 
So in 2011, I did not know that it is the 100th year anniversary of this International Women's Day. And it so happened, I don't know what happened, but anyway, in, in New York, there is an, an organization called uh, Women Deliver in New York. And because of that 100 years thing, they put up what they call 100 list of 100 inspiring people in the world, beginning with Hillary Clinton and Oprah Winfrey and all these people. And it so happened my name was there also. Can you imagine? Okay, how they got my name, I don't know. But anyway, it was picked up here by our newspaper and then they made a lot of fuss about it. And then one day I got a phone call. A lady told me, Sister, could you could I meet you? I said, okay, where are you in this place? So I went to her office and then she said to me, Sister, I want to honor you. Do you have a project? She asked me. I read your I read the, the newspaper article about your being one of the 100 inspiring people, something. Do you have a project? She said, Oh yeah, I have a project. I said, because I, that hospital was there. We have a land, but we don't have money. And she said, oh, I have a foundation it's called Hadith because you know what she, and then she told me, sister, don't you, don't, you, don't you recognize me? I said, I'm sorry, I don't recognize you. She said, I was one of your, your scholars. You know, I was dean of college for 18 years and president for six years. So I am the one interviewing the, the scholars. But there are about, <laughs> my goodness, uh, she was talking about 2008. And this is, uh, no, 1988. And this is 2011. How can I remember 100 people that I interviewed in, in 1988? So I said, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't really remember. I said, I was one of your scholars, she said like that, and I, I would like to, uh, to, to help you put up that hospital. Because you know what she is now? She is the president and CEO of Hyundai Asia. You know that Hyundai thing? And that's exactly what happened. He built, she built our convent and she built our hospital for nothing. I just spent, spent a single centavo. So can you imagine that you got a land for nothing and you got the construct, construction of a 21-bed hospital for nothing? What do you call that? Miracle? Synchronicity? Serendipity? I don't know. For me, it's a miracle. Very good news. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. And that keeps on happening. It's funny, isn't it? Ha, ha, ha.